third of five Sundays from the sixth chapter of John's Gospel on the theme of the Eucharist, kind of extending the uh, celebration of the Eucharistic revival in our country. And uh, today I'd like to look at the early Christians, how they completely baffled the people that were in charge of the world at the time in the Roman Empire. The pagans didn't know what to do with these Christians. In fact, they didn't even think it was a religion at first because they didn't have sacrifices like the pagans had, which were animal sacrifices, just like the Jewish people had in the temple. They didn't have sacrifices. And they said, they believed that some Jew that we executed rose from the dead. What? You know, they just couldn't figure it out at all. Certain things that Christians did didn't make any sense to them. For example, Catholic charities. There was no such thing as the welfare state in the ancient world. If you were poor, uh, they considered, they said there was something wrong with you or you didn't deserve any help. That was the pagan attitude. And they couldn't figure out why these Christians cared for widows, orphans, and people that with disabilities, and other people who were in need. In fact, uh, to, we, we have the case yesterday was the feast of St. Lawrence, a deacon in Rome. And I checked with a, a, a deacon bill beforehand so I could make sure I got the story straight. The Roman police found out that Lawrence, who was the deacon of Rome, who was in charge of Catholic charities. And so they came to him and they said, we're here to confiscate the treasures of the church that you're wasting on all these poor people. And so he said, well, that's going to take a while to get all the treasures together. And they said, we'll be back. And in three days, they returned. And uh, Deacon Lawrence, I'm kind of embellishing the story for you to understand. He basically said, behind door number one, we have the treasures of the church. So they rushed to it and they opened it. You know what they found on the other side of the door? Widows, orphans, people with disabilities. And they said, what's this? And he said, this is the treasure of the church. You see how bold he was in practicing his faith? So they didn't appreciate his remarks. So they just decided to torture him to death. You ever see a picture of St. Lawrence? There's a grill. It, you say, what is that? It's, it's like, is it a prison bar? No, it's a grill. They grilled him to death. And I checked this out with Deacon Bill because I heard this. And he's a deacon, he should know and everything like this. St. <laughs> Lawrence is reported to have said something that sounds straight out of the WWF or the UFC. Do you know what he said? He said, turn me over. I'm done on this side. That kind of boldness and living the faith uh, was something that was very characteristic. And the pagans didn't know what to do with these people. They had these strange things. They cared, for example, about babies, even babies who had health problems. They took care of them. They said, why are you doing that? Get rid of it. That was the pagan attitude. And they, they couldn't, the pagans couldn't figure out these things. Uh, St. Cyprian in Carthage, we actually have some of the a report of what happened when he was arrested brought before the judge. Now, how's this about uh, uh, a, a judge kind of being biased? He said, so are you a member of the sacrilegious cult of atheists who refuse to honor the wisdom of the gods of Rome? And St. Saint, Saint Cyprian said, yes, I am. That boldness, where did they get this boldness from? I think one of the places that they got it through the Holy Spirit was the example of Jesus himself. Because there's something very interesting in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. In fact, 
you know that that number that comes up a lot in a lot of end of the world scenarios? What's the, what's the magic the, the, or the, the cursed number? Six, six, six. Well, go home and go to the sixth chapter of St. John and go to chapter six, verse 66. And it's the only time recorded in the Bible where people who actually believed and followed Jesus said to him, that's enough, I don't want to hear anymore, goodbye, I'm going back to the pagan rites. What did Jesus say to them that said to them, oh, I can't, I can't listen to any more of this stuff. He said what we heard today, my flesh and my blood are your food and drink. This sounded disgusting to them. In fact, some of the pagans, they understood the Christian understanding of the Eucharist so thoroughly that you know how sometimes when you hear a rumor where everybody gets everything wrong, but it tells you something about what they understood? Well, the, uh, the pagan Romans accused the Christians of infant cannibalism. Where did they get such a bizarre idea? Because they heard bits and pieces about Bethlehem and baby Jesus and the, and the, and the shepherds and the angels and all of that. And then they said, and they're, when they come together, they're eating human flesh and blood. What this means is the early Christians, everybody else understood the early Christians really believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Otherwise, even though this is kind of a left-handed type of understanding of it from the pagan side, the pagans knew what the early Christians meant when they talked about the Eucharist really being the body and blood of Christ. But Jesus even goes further because you know how sometimes when somebody's giving a speech and everybody goes, oh, no, 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 no. They say, well, let me explain this in another way, okay? And we, we hear this all the time. Uh, but Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you shall not have life within you. And that's people, that's the thing that people said, no, I don't want to hear any more of this stuff. Uh, I'm out of here. And Jesus had the perfect opportunity at that time to weasel out of that statement. He said, oh, excuse me, you just kind of, you, you didn't understand me correctly. Let, let, me, let me rephrase that. You're symbolically eating my body. No, he didn't say anything like that. The interesting thing is it doesn't come across in English, but it comes across in the original biblical text written in Greek. Jesus didn't say, let me soften that statement. No, he expanded the statement. And he said to them, I'm not asking you to eat my body and drink my blood. I'm asking you to chew on my body. I'm asking you to gurgle in your mouth my blood. And Jesus was, of course, making a statement, I'm not backing away from my original statement, I'm strengthening it all the further. And in several texts that have come from the early church, we, that have been discovered, they were hidden in monasteries and only really discovered until the 1800s, we find the things like the teaching of the 12 apostles, uh, we find the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, we find uh, the letters of St. Irenaeus of Lyon. And they talk about the fact that the early Christians really believed that everything was literally true. And the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel is really is my body and my blood. The resurrected body of Jesus, you as you know, did all sorts of things. He was able to get places faster. He was able to go through locked doors. He was able to ascend into heaven. And he's able to be among us in the 
sacrament of his body and blood for all time until he returns again in glory. In fact, Saint uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, he may not have invented this term, but he's credited with it because he talks about it in his uh, writings. And he talks about it in a way that he doesn't say, hey, I have a new way of looking at this. No, it's more like, uh, as you know, he talks about the Eucharist as the, here's his words, the medicine of immortality. Where did he get this thought? Jesus said, if you eat my body and drink my blood, you'll never die. Now, of course, we'll physically die, but spiritually we'd be alive because taking Christ into our bodies as well as into our hearts, allowing the Holy Spirit to have a dwelling place within the core of our very being. Being Christian is to be really fulfilled, successful, happy in every respect. And when we die, none of that changes. We may for a while, until the resurrection, lose our bodies. But our souls, it'll be a moment that a person who is united to Christ in faith has devoutly received him in the Eucharist and allows the Holy Spirit to direct their lives. When you die, it's like you close your eyes and you open them and you say, Jesus, what are you doing here? <laughs> oh my God, I'm in heaven. And that's the kind of Christian life that is the fullness of life that already we, we share in the reality that is to come. Do you know why? We're already eating from the banquet of heaven, from the banquet of the holy sacrifice of the mass on earth. What do they serve at the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven? Communion. What do we serve here? Communion. That's why, as I've said in a previous week in the first Eucharistic prayer, it talks about these gifts are born by the God's angel. They're taken up to heaven as we receive from this altar the same menu that they feast on in heavenly glory forever. Um, what is heaven like? It's sharing the banquet the wedding feast of the Lamb, as the book of Revelation talks about. And it shares with us the reality of everything that the saints enjoy in heaven. We have a share in it here, right, and now. So we should be bold, as St. Lawrence was, as St. Cyprian was, as even Jesus is. This really is his body and blood. Now, uh, you know, when you go back to the original text of the Bible, Jesus says, this is my body. This is my blood. Now, I do fully realize that as Americans, that a very famous American several years ago made this sort of interesting statement, well, that depends on what the meaning of is is. I don't know if you ever remember that statement. Well, I want to tell you something about Greek. The word tuto estin ho moia, soma, this is my body. The Greek doesn't mean kind of like, sort of similar to, or anything. In Greek, is means is and nothing else, or no shade of gray, black and white in our boldness in professing the reality of the Eucharist upon the altar, the Eucharist we receive is the doorway of allowing Christ to be in every part of our lives so that we are sharers in his body and blood. As we come forward to receive our Lord in the Eucharist today, he is really present to you. So pro present yourselves to him with a clear conscience, with an open heart, and with an open mind. And what 
is on the altar is what will be in your minds, your hearts, your souls, your bodies as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>